Leith Arbuthnot. Welcome to the Great Big Book Club. Thanks very How much. How are you? I'm really well, thanks. How are you doing? Very well. Congratulations on the publication of Looking for Eliza. Thank you. It is uh, Orion, published by Orion. Yep. Um, and uh, it's been brilliantly reviewed everywhere and you're selling brilliantly well, so well done. Um, if you could possibly read us a bit uh, to give us a flavour of the book and then we can have a chat about it afterwards. Yes, um, I'm going to read uh, originally from chapter one <laughs> because um, why not start at the beginning? So, the moment Ada walked into the small supermarket on Iffy Road, she knew something sinister had happened to it since her last visit. Had the aisles moved three inches to the left? Had some zealous store manager set up a deli counter at the back, bunching everything else up in the shop? She grabbed a loaf of rye bread from the baked goods section by the flowers and walked vigilantly down the fruit aisle. Something was def definitely off. She remembered visiting an earthquake room with Michael years ago in some London museum. There was a mock-up of a greengrocer's on level two with a shopping trolley and all these fake cereal boxes everywhere. And every few minutes, the whole thing would start shaking terrifically to give visitors a sense of what being in an earthquake was like. Ada had found the room mildly boring. Michael loved it and stood there for a long time, grinning along with the seven-year-olds whenever the quake began. At any moment, she felt, this shop too would start shivering, its tins threatening to spring from their shelves. This time, Michael wasn't around to smile at the tremors. Ada squared her shoulders, trying to work out what was different. At the back of the shop, where she usually lined up with her basket by the chewing gum and the snack bars, wondering whether it would be Adil at the till today, or Fatima, or very possibly Kim, hopefully not. There were six machines. They looked like cramped cash points. They were self-checkouts, each gleaming with 21st century newness, lasers for barcode scanning, glowing from their bellies like demonic eyes. Ada froze. So the human tills had been replaced. Adil was nowhere to be seen, nor was Fatima. Kim was there, though, standing by the last machine in the row. She looked more glum than Ada had ever seen her. In beige moments at home, when the ticking of the clock in the sitting room seemed textured and malign, Ada liked to distract herself by marvelling at the Herculean glumness of supermarket Kim, a stringy 30-year-old with turquoise pigtails and a reliably com complicated constellation of spots on her face, who once told Ada, in a rare two-minute confession, that she lived over the shop with her mum, so she could take her breaks in bed with Nirvana on loud. But now Kim was looking dejected. She was frozen on the spot, like Ada, staring into the middle distance, the tip of one pigtail in her mouth. Only her lips were moving, rumatively massaging the hair poking in, pulling more of it into her mouth as a camel might with a spear of grass. I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's beautiful. Um, your story uh, um, is about Ada, who's a, a widowed writer living on her own in Oxford. And uh, so she put, does she put herself up as sort of a, a renter gram? Is that the idea? Yes. Um, so so it, it's, um, it's about a widowed poet who, um, who loses her husband kind of at the start of the story. Um, and she has spent a lifetime with this, with this man um, who's a professor at Oxford. Um, and she doesn't really know who to be, you know, in the world now that this kind of scaffold has been removed. Um, and so in a, in a sort of crazy bid to find a community and find purpose, she decides to rent herself out uh, in Oxford as a kind of um, grandmother for hire. Um, so she, you know, attends weddings and teaches etiquette and um, does all sorts of kind of, gets up to all sorts of um, hijinks in Oxford. And, and the story is also about a, another young woman who's, well, a young woman who's, who's very isolated as well, but for really different reasons, who um, lives opposite Ada um, and is in her 20s um, and living a, a quite a lonely existence. Um, she's from Carlisle. She, she's a student um, and she just doesn't really feel like she's found her place in the world either. So um, the book is partly about their friendship and the kind of redemptive power of, you know, women talking to one another and um, learning to love one another in a you know platonic way in this case. Um, did you, how did you come up with the idea? Did you see a sort of rent a grand ad or something? <laughs> um, actually, I didn't. Um, but <laughs> I, so um, I, I re was reading years ago about 
how in Japan you can actually rent um, yourself out as a girlfriend or a father or you know you can um, say you want you want to return to your village um, and maintain an illusion of having a good life in Tokyo or whatever you can um, bring along a troop of hired actors to play those roles for you um, and I was quite struck by that as a kind of um, about what it was saying about you know capitalism and um, and family life and how um, you know we, we increasingly in the in the moneyed West we try to throw money at, at, at you know dirt like problems of of emotional kind of deficit um, and so I wanted to look at it look at how that might work but in a British or, or English context um, and I thought you know um, it might be quite fun to have a kind of slightly eccentric um, lady uh, going around Oxford um, hiring herself out. But it's, it's been brilliant and did it take a long time to you to write? Because I know you've got, uh, you work as a, as a book reviewer and, uh, um, and a journalist and an editor so you, you're sort of totally immersed in the world of words already. I mean it must have taken quite a lot of effort to do all of that and then come and then actually write at the same time. Yeah, um, so um, at the time that I was writing it, I, so I'm now a freelance journalist, but at the time I was, I was full time at the Sunday Times. And so, um, it, you know, I was dealing with words all day long and, um, and then would, uh, you know, would write before work or during my lunch break or after work, um, not, not usually all three. And so I think that, that, it, that was quite a challenge in some ways. But I think also um, being a kind of jobbing writer means that um, it was useful in the sense that I, I don't see writing as like a particularly mystical art. Like I, I, don't, I don't give myself that many excuses for not doing it. Whereas I think if, you're, if your day job is in something else, perhaps you can allow yourself to be a bit more kind of misty eyed about the, about the art of writing. Um, and so, yeah, so it took me um, about, well, I got, I got a publishing deal and then, um, you know, having written the first 5,000 words, and then I wrote the rest of it um, in, you know, four or five months um, and then needed a really big edit at the end, you know, because I, I sort of, I concentrated on smashing it out and then, um, you know, going back and like seeing what, what I could change that would be better. Brilliant. And then what, would, what were your influences were when you were writing it? I mean, were you an avid reader of, I don't know, Zoe Heller? What's your, who are your... Yeah. Um, I think uh, quite an important book for me was Lonely City by Olivia Lang, um, which uh, is, a, is a wonderful book um, about a kind of, you know, quite isolated, well, in this case, Olivia Lang, um, uh, her kind of life in New York, and also an exploration of how different artists have kind of harvested the, the best from extreme loneliness and turned it into, uh, um, into like great art. And I think that was one of the kind of drumbeats um, for me throughout the, throughout the book, because um, I, I mean, I think that, you know, loneliness is, a, is obviously a phenomenon that, that um, is, being, is being experienced, you know, across the world at the moment, but, you know, given the pandemic, but also um, it feels particularly um, pertinent, um, you know, in modern times when we're all more connected, um, but but we we still somehow aren't finding proper properly meaningful relationships in our in our you know everyday life. Um, so I wanted to I think that was one of my motivational kind of books to to try and like you know find the best in loneliness generally. Um, well, it's it's done incredibly well. Are you going to uh, are you going to write another one? Are you are you doing it now? I mean, it's um, like. <laughs> yeah well um so i'm i'm sort of trying to work work out my next step so uh, over the course of the lockdown i've been i've done a quite strange experiment where i've been sending out um a serialized story every week so i have a, a load of people who have subscribed to, to my kind of this novel that i've been writing um and every week i've dropped five thousand words into their inbox of the story um, and so i'm now i've now finished that i've written the first, you know 55000 words or something it's very and charles dickens of you <laughs> i know i'm slightly <laughs> embarrassed by the comparison i i i want to underline that i don't think of myself as in his league <laughs> i i've been trying to work out like now with a bit of distance of about a week and um, whether that will um, provide the kind of basis for my next book or whether i want to um you know read some, uh, write something else i've just finished um atessa mosve's uh, my year of rest and relaxation which um has been an absolutely 
like uh, such an inspirational book. That's fabulous, that book, isn't it? It's yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, so now I, I, all I want to do is write exactly what she's written. Only won't be as won't be as good. Um, so yeah, I, I'm a bit I'm un, unsure, but um, I, I certainly will be trying to get something published um, ASAP, basically. Well, that's brilliant. Listen, uh, thank you for joining us, Leaf. You've been absolutely sensational. Thanks, Looking for Eliza has been fantastically reviewed. It's a brilliant debut, witty, sharply observed, and beautifully told. A must read, and it's published by Orion. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Ellen Alston. Uh, welcome to the Great Big Book Club, and congratulations on your brand new novel, Zarina. Zarina is the one and only and first ever novel about Catherine the first of Russia, not Catherine the second. And my heroine was born an illiterate surf girl, so an unfree peasant attached to an estate of a master, and rose to being the first ruling empress of Russia ever. So it is also, it's actually a double Cinderella story. So a reviewer said that calling it a Cinderella story was doing her and her amazing character and indomitable spirit severe injustice. But it's also the story of Russia's transformation from a backward nation to the beginnings of the superpower we know it today. Brilliant, sorry, thank you. Could you give us a little bit of a read from it and then, uh, then we can have a chat afterwards? Gladly. He is dead. My beloved husband, the mighty Tsar of all the Russias, has died, and just in time. Moments before death came for him, Peter called for a quill and paper to be brought to him in his bedchamber in the Winter Palace. My heart almost sawed. He had not forgotten. He was going to drag me down with him. When he lost consciousness for the last time, and the darkness drew him closer to its very heart, the quill dropped from his fingers. Black ink spattered the soiled sheets. Time held its breath. What had the Tsar wanted to settle with that last effort of his tremendous spirit? I knew the answer. The candles in the tall candelabra filled the room with a heavy scent and an unsteady light. Their glow made shadows real and brought the woven figures on the Flemish tapestries to life. Their coarse features showing pain and disbelief. The voices of the people who'd stood outside the door all night were drowned out by the February wind, rattling furiously at the shutters. Time spread slowly, like oil on water. Peter had imprinted himself on our souls like his signet ring in hot wax. It seemed impossible that the world hadn't careened to a halt at his passing. My husband, the greatest will ever to impose itself on Russia had been more than our ruler. He had been our fate and he was still mine. The doctors Blumentrost, Paulson and Horn stood silently around Peter's bed staring at him, browbeaten. Five kopecks work of work of medicine given early enough could have saved him. Thank God for the quack's luck of good sense. Right, that was brilliant, that was wonderful. Can, um, so can you tell me a bit about uh, how you managed to come across the story of uh, Zarina? Because you used to be a, uh, a news Bloomberg TV presenter and producer. So it seems a very big step to go from to hard news to historical fiction. Exactly. So actually, it's Arena and I, we go way back. And I really refer to her as my girl because I discovered her. She was born as Marta. So sometimes I call her Marta. Sometimes I call her Catherine the First. I discovered her when age 13, reading a book called Germans and Russians, which charts the uh, millennial shared history of these two people who can both toil to the most terrible ends, if you think about it of the political regimes, really the German and the Russian regimes <laughs> outdid everybody else in terror and horror, but also have this innate understanding of beauty and tragedy. So in that book, a chapter was devoted to Catherine I, born, you know, a German Baltic serf, later becoming the Russian empress. So she bridged that gap between the two nations. And when I wanted to find out more about her, I realized that I couldn't because there was nothing about her. No thesis, no biography, no novel, nothing. 
And when I had finally matured to really start writing, I thought there was only one subject I could deal with. I hadn't studied history. I studied PPE in Paris. Um, and somehow my energies were always elsewhere. So it was here in London that I really started writing. And luckily enough, um, I found a brilliant agent and a brilliant publisher. That's amazing. But I mean, historical fiction is is a, a bitch to write because I've done it and it's really difficult to work out you know how much detail to put in how much uh how much and there's a brilliant thing that Hilary Mantel also says about how historical fiction you've got to realize that you are that you don't have the the value of hindsight when you're writing your character so uh so you have to write them in the present which is a very interesting idea and I wondered if you hadn't written a novel before, why did you go for, for one of the most difficult uh, genres? I think Imogen that naivety quite often protects you in life. So I read for a year and I did research for a year before I dared writing that, that opening sentence, so he has died and just in time. Um, so my research was vast. I read all the Russians, Gorgol, Tolstoy, um, you know, you, you name it. <laughs> I've read it. I, I watched experimental movies. I immersed myself into the travel descriptions of a 17th century merchant who visits Tsar Mikhail Romanov, the second, second Romanov Tsar. And then I had always read a lot, everything ra ranging from Victoria Holt, Jean Plady, yes, up to Hilary Mantel who's really a beacon of hope for everybody who writes historic fiction. Um, so I think I just started, but then it took a long time. I wrote for almost one and a half years and with the explicit goal to make every scene the absolute best I could. And um, yeah, quite similar to many other writers, then the editing was ruthless. I think about 300 pages, so a novel in itself, got the cull. And it was just this information overload that you have too much detail and too many conversations with too much information and that the story gets lost underneath. And interestingly enough, even though the Petrine era, so the time of Peter the Great is wonderfully documented, her life of course is full of tantalizing blanks, her youth as a surf girl. A lot of reviewers and readers have said that they enjoyed these first 200 pages of the novel especially because history is not only about kings and queens and within that very stringent framework of historic given facts you could really let your imagination run wild with the given facts you have. Absolutely and so what did you find it difficult to get published? I mean as a first time novelist with coming out with historical fiction yeah uh, I mean you know it's it's quite difficult to get yourself over the line with that one. Yes, I'm not only a first-time uh, novelist with historical fiction, but I'm also a foreigner, one has to say, who writes the English. So um, uh, that was a fact I, I mostly omitted <laughs> from, my, from my application letters I, I wrote. Um, I had a couple of rejections, public agents saying straight out, you know, the British and the Commonwealth, they love everything related to the Tudors. As we know, we just never tire of the story of Henry VIII and, and, and Anne Boleyn and, and his other loves and wives. Um, but everything that's in the steps is really not interesting. I think for Tsarina, equally the moment was right. This idea of female empowerment, this woman, as La Stampa wrote, she overcomes a fate raging against her. Whatever life throws at her, she just gets up again, dusts herself up and sees the sun rise another day. She always makes the best of what's given to her. And of course, the political situation has changed too. So it's not only women who are coming more to the forefront, but equally Russia is once more how Churchill said, I believe, is sort of this riddle wrapped in an enigma and um, everything that is in the country, the whole social makeup that she observes as a foreigner, because she can actually observe Russia as an outsider, because she's not Russian, is in the social makeup of the country today again. Also, we, we practically have a Tsar again in Russia. So a lot that's in the book is actually there today. It's historical modern, but it's, it's intensely modern. Um, absolutely. And did you, are you, the, the real thing with a massive labor of love, like the Tsarina is, <laughs> Do you have anything in the tank for the next one? Do you have another one coming? <laughs> absolutely obsessed with Serena and her world, the Russian Baroque, and even going one step back. So the sequel is finished, 
I think it's planned to be published um, next year, next autumn. And now I'm planning for a prequel. And then, yes, I actually have sort of a pipeline of um, <clears throat> seven novels, dare I say it, in, in the same vein. <laughs> so I'm just breaking it here to the seven. The subject is, you know, everybody always concentrates. I shouldn't say it because the competition is vast out there. But there's so much more than Catherine the Great and the last Serena. Uh, it's, an, it's an amazing country and full of stories and myths and fairy tales. And you can weave it all together. You know it. I, I, you know it from your own fabulous book, The Witches of St. Petersburg. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, my darling, thank you so much, Alan. Congratulations on, uh, on Zarina. It's been described as a vivid page turner of the debut in the Times, and it is published by Bloomsbury. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Bye-bye. And -bye. Um, Nana Ofriata Aim. Hello and welcome to the Great Big Book Club, all the way from Ghana. Yeah. Uh, so congratulations on your first novel, uh, The Godchild, published by Bloomsbury, which is sort of, is a massive coming of age story, isn't it? Yeah. Um, could, you, could you possibly give us a, a little bit of a, a, a blast of it and then we can just discuss it afterwards? Okay, I should just go straight into reading? Yes, please, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so this is quite close to the beginning. It's the second chapter. Um, okay. Abile, my mother sang at the dressing mirror as I lay on the satin quilted cover on the bed behind her watching. Abile, she danced in her chair, the ends of her mouth turned half downwards in appreciation. It's a pity my child did not take my beauty, she told her reflection, putting cream on her face, caressing it into the softness, surveying the escarpment of cheekbones, the glow trapped in the amber recesses of her skin, she turned to me as if remembering. You must always look more than perfect, not just good enough, but perfect. You must always be better than them in everything you do, otherwise they think they will think you are lower. My mother came out, the smell of her powdery luxury encasing me, watering my eyes. I opened them. She walked sideways down the stairs, her shoes clacking against the heels of her feet. Would it arrive every night, this desire to perfection, like the ability to smell expensive and wear fitted petticoats? Maya, what is wrong with you, this girl? Do you want your father to come home and trouble my life? Ah. I walk down the stairs, slowly, sideways, towards my mother, far like the rest of the world. When I reached her, she buttoned on my coat. My arms stuck out to both sides. I looked past her at my reflection in the mirror half there, half in another place. She was stepping back to look at me, edging towards the open door by the front door, uh, edging towards the open box by the front door. I closed my eyes, not wanting to see her fall. Aish, she shouted. I opened my eyes. She was not sitting on top of the large new television, but suspended above it, her arms stemmed behind her against the wall, her legs spread out, skirt hiked up. I began to laugh. Ah. This time, her harshness came through her laughter. Questia, come and help me. I pulled her up, her weight threatening to knock me over. She looked into the box, turning the corners of her mouth down. Hmm, she said, her skirt still hiked up around her thighs. They shall see. I walked next to her through the more than perfect neighborhood of semi-detached red brick houses, made only less so by the African family camouflaged within one of them. Less than perfect, but not jarringly so, because he was a doctor and his wife was beautiful and his daughter immaculately groomed. Less than perfect, because they hung their washing out in the garden until the neighbor told them not so, not to. Less than perfect, because their television was propped up with books and not a stand. Less than perfect, because a father deemed the new television with stand the mother bought with his credit card too expensive and was having it returned. But still, separate from the men that stood huddled outside the Bahnhof, and McDonald's reeking of illegality. The woman that sat in the Afro shops chatting in mismatched syncopated chorus as the hairdressers braided hair and the cloth sellers took out dotted striped stamped legs of Dutch wax, like multicolored species of exotic animals. I looked up at my mother, talking too loud in her unperfected accent. People looked at her as she walked past, but she did not notice. Because even if I had not taken her beauty, she did not understand that to be better than them, you had to be like them so completely that they no longer noticed your difference. 
I do not know whether it was there from the beginning, this knowledge that I was never just I, myself, but an I that was in me and also outside, and that watched and witnessed all I did and everything around. When I later heard in words about the ancestors, I already knew, and when my father gave me the name Eno, grandmother, while almost still a baby, it was because he too could see that what I saw and understood was not mine alone. It began to rain. She wrapped me close to her, her pea green silk raincoat giving shelter to us both as we ran. We reached the department store and rode on the escalator up past the electronics, the cosmetics, the household goods and underwear to the woman's designer section. It was almost empty. Outside it was getting dark and the Germans were sitting down to their oven food. The sales lady looked us up and down as we passed, still dripping. My mother was weaving in and out of the racks like a person drunk, her hands scanning silks, polyesters, sequins and feathers, taking down one after the other until her arms were full, clothes trailing behind her on the floor. The salesman stood behind us now, but my mother still did not notice. Can I help you? She asked in a thoroughly unhelpful tone. My mother turned around now and laughed. Ich will Alice, Alice kaufen, she said. Alice, hilf mir. She addressed the woman in the familiar du, not the formal Z, and handed her the clothes. She looked vaguely left and vaguely right, brow furrowed as if concentrating, but her body movement betrayed no focus at all. She dropped her scarf behind her. I looked at it on the floor, looked at the woman's frowning face as she bent to pick it up and followed my mother like a lady's maid. I turned towards the children's section. I ran my hands through the clothes like my mother, stopping at velvets and soft, dark cords. I closed my eyes and saw myself in the cords, a perfect German girl, a young Romy Schneider running through the forest, arms outstretched towards a fenced in deer, smiling like the girl on the road section, six fruit juice bottle, cheeks apple red to match the handkerchief on her head. Guck mal, guck mal, der Mega. It was a little girl's voice behind me. Her hand stopped on the wine red velvet, my hand stopped on the right wine red velvet dress. I looked up to see who she meant then turned towards her. She was pointing at me. She had mistaken me for a boy. Her mother looked at me angrily, took the girl's hand and walked away. I stopped to look in the small full length mirror on the left. My hair was in four large plaits. It was true, I was wearing trousers, but how could she mistake me for a boy? My father always told me to wear earrings and I did not. I touched my ears. Beautiful, I heard behind me, yes. My mother was picking up the red velvet dress and another, peach with white lace ruches and a satin band. She was picking out white shoes and a white dress with strawberries on the left breast. She was picking cord dungarees and a matching shirt. Ich bin Prinzessin, wissen Sie, she was saying to the saleswoman. Prinzessin, ja. Yeah. She was telling her that where she came from, her clothes were made of lace and gold and that she had servants and grew up in a palace. The woman was looking a little frightened now. My mother went into the changing room and I followed to be turned into a little princess in the making, beauty to air. When we left with five plastic bags, there were four salesmen, ten, sal four saleswomen tending to my mother. She paid with my father's credit card. They walked with us. They patted my hair. They helped my mother onto the escalator. Tschüss, Konzessin, ja, tschüss. She did not look back. Her eyes were fixed downwards. I followed them and saw what she saw a large cupboard full of plates of all sizes and depths, white plates with solid ink blue borders and swirls of gold that nestled inside the, bold, the borders, like gold tipped swans at the edge of a lake, bewitched. We reached the ground floor and she headed towards them, not straight, but walking in a kind of zigzag. I looked around, no one was watching. She stood in front of the cupboard and this time a man came to her side. Yeah, he said, his eyebrows raised. Wie viel, she asked. Wie viele Teller, he asked the eccentric woman wanting to know the number of plates. Wie viel kostet die? She pointed at the plates. The man looked confused. Did she want to know the price of one plate? Sie will wissen, wie viel alles zusammen kostet, I offered. Ah, the man said and went to the counter and opened a book. He came back with it and showed my mother, silently, looking up. Ich kaufe, she said. His eyebrows moved up higher. He closed the book and led us to the counter. My mother handed over the card and told the salesman that the plates must be delivered during daytime, before six, and not at weekends. She did not want my father to see. Natürlich, the man said, smiling tightly. 
He handed her the receipt and looked down at me. Du sprichst aber gut Deutsch, he said. Not a compliment so much as a statement of fact. It always surprised them that my German was fluent. I put on my broad little girl smile and shrugged my, I don't know how it came to be so fluent either shrug. My apologetic and surprised by my own ingenuity shrug so that he would not realize that I had worked at the mastering and not at the, as they assumed acquired it by accident or oversight. I smiled the smile that was rose patterned wallpaper over the extant unpapered cracks to which if they looked hard enough, they might have seen a room within a room, a bulb naked and alone, a bare table covered in layered faded scrawl, its wood splintered and creviced, an empty chair against the wall, a shadow of something or someone that had already long left, and at the far end, barely visible, but there, an open door. Fantastic, thank you so much. So they, the Godchild is basically a story about Maya, who, who grows up in Germany. Yeah, the book centers on Maya, um, who's Ghanaian, um, and grows up between Ghana and Germany. Um, and her mother comes from this fictional royal family, comes from this dynasty. Um, and she's very extravagant, very exuberant, very larger than life character. Her father, on the other hand, is this very studious, reserved um, character. Um, and Maya grows up as an only child and, and feels somehow quite disconnected both from the world that she is growing up in, in these Western worlds, but also from her parents' world. You know, her mother talks about this kingdom and, and, and these dynasties, but, but it's very, very disconnected from the reality that Maya grows up in until her cousin, Kojo, um, who's also her mother's godchild, comes to stay with them when she's about eight years old. Um, and he changes everything. He opens up this magical world and makes it real to her. Um, and they, they go on this mission as young children to try and, in a way, correct the, the wrongs of their past, like the downfall of their kingdom through this book of histories, um, which is this kind of Bohesian thing that they, um, that they try and recreate. Um, and it has this big impact on them, both good and bad. And, and yeah, it's, it's a coming of age story about the two of them. Um, you're so successful uh, as a filmmaker and uh, you, you, uh, you did the Ghana's first billion at the Venice Beyond the Annale, and you've got so many strings to your bow. Why did you want to write a novel? Um, it's funny because people kind of think that all the other stuff came before, but I think the writing it in a way came before everything else. It's the thing that's closest to me. Um, but it's the most and, exposing thing to do though, isn't it? It's the most exposing thing to do. So it's, yeah. it's, everything else, because, because you know, you, it either works or it doesn't work. Do you know what I mean? So if you're so successful, which you are incredibly, it seems, uh, it seems a very um, vulnerable, position to put yourself in yeah but vulnerable is good no yeah, um absolutely yeah i am um, i mean i think that the the other things that i i do like the art stuff and and etc a lot of that was um i think a lot of people who are from an african context feel that they cannot just be a content maker they also need to be a context provider so um um, you know, that we need to, in a way, provide the own context of our creation because for so long they were, the context were provided for us, especially in the mainstream. And so a lot of what I did before was also creating the context for my own creation, in a way, paving the ground. Um, yeah. And how long did it take you to write? Were you, uh, was it, were you writing piecemeal or did you actually manage to get a proper, you know, six months? sitting at a desk or were you were you because you're so busy doing you know being a visiting fellow at Oxford University or doing whatever the, the myriad of incredible things that you have done was it did you did you just write in the back of the car or was it <laughs> a full six months um I no I wrote it it was many many years um and you know, I always say that residencies were, were my saving grace. Um, I did, you know, residencies in Brazil and Norway and France and Senegal and Ethiopia, like lots of residencies all over. Um, and they, you know, three months here, 
one month there, three months there. And so I wrote, the, wrote it mainly at residency. And did you, uh, what are your other influences as, as a writer? Did you, were you an avid reader as you were growing up? Yeah, I mean, um, it was interesting to hear about Sarina actually studied Russian literature. Um, and so, you know, Anna Akhmatova, Marina Stratayeva, um, Borges, obviously, um, Dumbled Tamara Chera, Zora Neale Hurston, um, yeah, uncountable people, yeah, amount of people. And uh, was it difficult to get published? Were you, were you, was it, uh, were you knocking on lots of doors? Did you sell like uh, Leaf did on, on 3,000 words or 5,000 words, which is almost unheard of, I have to say, Leaf. Um, and, uh, or did you, uh, or did you manage, or did you have to do the whole thing first? Um, I think once I got my agent, I got my agent, um, yeah, I got, once I got my agent, it felt quite, she's just such an amazing, supportive champion. Um, and so I kind of felt like I, it, it would land in the right place because she, I was just, I felt so right with her. Um, and so she, I think, you know, did the going to book fairs and things. And then Bloomsbury was just the right fit. And also um, Alexandra, who's, who's at Bloomsbury, is, is incredible. So... Um, yeah, I think getting the agent was, you know, it felt like it was going to happen in the right way because I have such a, such a supporting agent. And, uh, are you doing another one? Yeah, so I'm working on something right now, um, which is going to be finished by the end of this year, which is more nonfiction. Um, and then I'm working also in the back of my mind on the second novel as well, which is more historical as well. It goes back in, in, in history into the kingdoms, you know, here in Ghana. How exciting. That sounds amazing. That's a big, um, yeah. um, well, listen, thank you so much for joining us. The God Child, uh, published by Bloomsbury, has been described as meditative, gestural, philosophic, and brave, unprecedented. Doesn't get better than that, frankly, as a review. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Nana. Thank you.